Hello, hello, here we are. Three minutes late. There we are. Hello, Live at Fivers. Is anybody going to join me? It'd be nice if they did. There we are. Welcome to the Live at 5.30. Live at 5.30. Uh, talk about the link between depression and rider confidence. And hello, who's first? Emma, she's straight there. She's like a racehorse. There we go. Jerry, Teresa, hello, 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 hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the link with depression and rider confidence. Quite honestly, we don't care about the link. What we care about is the solution. I hope you're fine. Right, excuse me while I just ignore you a second. Well, I'm going to try to get a response from my own computer over here that Carl is live and then hopefully I can read your contributions on my computer without having to step forward at the, at the screen and everyone watching us. There we are. Okay, let's have a little look. Okay, so Carl is live. There we are. There we are. There we are. Let's have a little look. Okay, hello everybody. Great, nice to see you all. Thank you so much for all joining. There we are. So I've got the um, I've got the other live going on in the background. Hopefully, I can read your comments there. And there we are. It's got a slight delay. Let me turn the sound down. Oh, it's got a long delay. There we are. We'll just turn that turn that off. There we are. And then hopefully, on this computer here. I'll be able to read your comments. There we are. Hello, everybody. I don't know if this is going to work. Wow, what a lot of people. Thank you all for joining. Okay, hi, 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 hi. Right then, so uh, this is the chat about depression that I would like to talk about more on my talks around the country and on my Rider Confidence course. I would, hi Lisa, hi Michelle. Um, I would like to talk more about depression and Crucially, what to do about it. I don't want to talk about depression. I want to talk about a better life beyond depression when, when we've recovered. So, okay. Is there anybody here who has not bought and read the book or perhaps forgotten what was in it? I suspect there are. If you haven't bought the book, and I haven't all called you here to sell my book, but go to www.carlgreenwood.co.uk, buy the book. Um, it's actually free, but you have to pay the, the postage and packaging. Um, and it's not very big at all. So you can do it in, in two hours and it's got a load of information. I am going to cover some of the information on this first part. Um, I hope that's all right with you. If you've already bought the book and you already know, and you've been to the courses and watched the videos or, or been on my Rider Confidence course, you will know this already, of course. You'll know it. Ooh, you're gonna get tested. Okay. I will start by just chatting about what happens. So these are my golden moments. That's not actually worked very well, me going down there. Let's move this slightly up so I can be seen. There we are. And I'll move this board a little bit closer. Okay. So the thing that goes on in our brains, can we see that? Give me some thumbs up if you can see the board. Let's just check the comments that everybody can see. Okay then. Oh, well done, Joe. Halfway, halfway through the book. I had a great email the other day from someone who was halfway through the book and had gone off and had a really good uh, ride on her horse and was absolutely delighted. But there we go. I'm just going to adjust. Sorry, I hope I don't make you all feel sick here. So I'm just going to try and adjust that a little bit more to get it a bit more up and we can see what's going on. Allow me to remind you. Okay, okay, this is a conference, and it is a conference because you're going to contribute. Okay, uh, yeah, I could move forward a bit and then it'd be a little less blurred. Okay, right, is everything I'm writing back to front? Depression and confidence. Everything I'm writing back to front. Okay. 
There we are. If it is, I could try turning the turning the camera around, or or you could just change your heads. Okay then. So, oh, I've shot shot myself out of shot. So, this is what's going on. Okay. You can just move your comments out to the side so I can see myself. Okay, so I'm going to draw here a picture of a brain. Okay, it's uh, not anatomically correct or to scale, but a brain it is nonetheless. This is the primitive brain where the fight and flight responses live. Okay, um, it's got no reason, no logic, no imagination. It just sits there quietly doing absolutely nothing scanning for danger but otherwise doing absolutely nothing unless danger comes along if danger comes along or crucially the perception of danger comes along then it will respond with certain survival strategies so one survival strategy that it will use is anxiety if it detects danger it will respond with anxiety. Anxiety is very simple to understand as a survival strategy. If there are lions and tigers and bears behind every tree and bush, it pays to be not too far from your panic button. Another survival strategy it may use is anger. Anger is very simple to understand. It makes you stronger than usual. It makes you more impervious to pain. It makes you far more likely to win a fight. And another thing it might use is depression. And this is my golden moment in my talks. When I say depression and write this down here, most people perk up. This is how I know that depression is um, quite prominent. Now, I'm slightly annoying myself by seeing myself looking up. So I'm just going to make an adjustment to the camera here so that I can raise it up. I feel a bit funny. I'm looking down, so I'm just going to raise the camera a bit more up to eye level. That's it, it feels a bit more natural like that. There we are. There we are. Okay, so I'll carry on like that. So yes, the golden moment when I say that depression is a survival strategy, people perk up. But they didn't come to my Ride Confidence courses to be um, didn't talk about depression, they came around to talk about horses and they're quite surprised when they find that depression is linked. So how is depression a survival strategy? Well it works like this. If we are living in our cave, I've got a nice cave environment here, and if there's an ice age going on outside it means that there are too many cumulative problems to be able to overcome yeah it's an ice age you're going to get snowed to death and colded to death and eaten by polar bears and everything there's too many cumulative problems it would do no good at all for me to feel all lovely and positive and go to my cave and go oh don't worry i'll go and catch a rabbit <laughs> out we go and when they dig up my remains <laughs> in six thousand years time they analyze the contents of my stomach there's no rabbit. No, that would be an extremely foolish idea and that's blatantly obvious. So my primitive brain does what's good for me and it stops me feeling positive. In fact, it tells me to feel the absolute opposite, negative. That's why depression feels so awful. If I was in charge of evolution, I'd arrange things so that it felt like a nice warm fuzz, but there you are, I wasn't in charge. And that's why it feels so awful is because it's no good feeling positive and going out to a load of problems. So when a load of problems come, it pays to be depressed. Also, depression has built in it energy saving devices because you can't be bothered to do anything. You can't be bothered to get up. You can't be bothered to play with the rest of the members of your clan. You can't be bothered to clean the cave. You can't be bothered to phone your mum and do the washing up. <laughs> there we are. You just want to lay in bed, pull the mammoth skin over your head, wait for better times. When the, when the conditions lift, when it all improves, so the depression lifts and you're back to a nice blank brain sitting here, ready to get on with whatever it is you do as a species. There we are. 
Yes, humans, when the conditions improve, the depression is supposed to lift. <laughs> yeah, but why doesn't it? Here's why it doesn't. Because evolution went on, if you believe in that sort of thing. The moon's got lovely big red bottoms and giraffe's got big long necks. And all we got was a vastly augmented intellectual capability. I'm looking at my own image on the phone there. <laughs> but I really have got a very big forehead. <laughs> That's the house. My great big humanoid brain. What I need is a bit more hair to cover it. Because that's what we got. We got a cerebral cortex. This is the bit that looks like spaghetti. And it's the intellectual seat of our brain. I've put an eye there for intellect. I think that works either way it goes. And this is P for primitive. There we are. This is what makes us human. This is the bit that thinks, not this bit. This is the bit with logic, reason, imagination, language, all those things that make us human, and it turns this into a problem-solving factory. I'm going to write that there so we don't forget. Problem-solving factory. We love to solve problems. Love it. The Times has got the Times crossword has got its own fan club, but that's how much we love to solve problems. Um, when you pass your exams, you're filled with a sense of pride, and so on and so on. It's it's so addictive this solving problems that people do get addicted. Famously, teenagers sitting all night playing their computer games. And half the time, I've got to go down and nick dad's credit card <laughs> to be able to buy the extra little bits that they can do because they're addicted to computer games. And computer games are pointless. The only thing you're getting is the joy of going from level 47 to level 48. There's absolutely no sense in it at all. But we're addicted. That's how much it, it, it is human to want to be a problem-solving factory. In order to solve problems, we have to use this thing called imagination. Now, imagination is so powerful that we forget how powerful it can be. So, imagination. Suppose I wanted to make something to sit on. Yeah, I want to make something to sit on and I'm thinking, right, okay. My imagination means that I can test things out before their reality. So if I want to make, uh, in my imagination, a chair out of something rigid, let's think of a rigid material, perhaps I could use ice. Ice is very rigid, isn't it? And I could carve a, a chair shape. Bearing in mind that I live in Britain, I would think that that would be a pretty duff idea, especially in the summer. And already in our imaginations, we see a big wet puddle on the floor and someone's sitting there with soggy bum and sore arms, cold off. There you go. I don't need to build it out of ice to know that's a stupid idea. I could build it out of plasticine. And already in our imaginations is a picture of a plasticine chair not doing the job very well at all and, and, and sit there on the floor. Now, I could build it out of brick. And already in our imaginations we can see that a brick chair would work even if it was tremendously ugly and looked like a barbecue. This is how useful imaginations are. They allow us to see it before it happens. This is so powerful that the other animals simply do not have this capacity. <laughs> Let me give an example. You might think that your dog is pretty smart, but you try giving it a long stick and calling it through a doorway. Yeah, we've all seen it. Even if they turn around and go backwards, they can't do it. That's because they haven't got imagination to be able to work out how to get a stick through a doorway. Most people wouldn't really be fl fl flummoxed by that problem. As you approach a door, you arrange the stick so that you can go through the doorway. It's nothing to us, but it's so exceptional. It's such a good tool that sometimes you can cut yourself. Anyway, let's move on. 
So we've got imagination and it lives here. So this is the new development. Oh, what are we doing? Okay, are we still there? So imagination all lives in here. Okay, at the front of your brain here is the part that's under your conscious control. This is your idea of you. I'll draw you here. Here anyway, I am drawing you here. There we go. You may have heard that you only use 10% of your brain or 20% of your brain or whatever amount of percent of your brain um, they care to make up. But under your conscious control is the lesser part. So this is like the boss of the factory. This is the factory floor. This is the health and safety officer with the emergency drills of anxiety, anger and depression. This is the way it works. This is the way it's supposed to work. You have a good idea. You're like, oh yeah, I'd like to go on a horse riding holiday around Mongolia. You put the order in. How do you put the order in? You put the order in by imagination, by visualizing a nice horse riding holiday around Mongolia, by visualizing it often, all the time in fact, boring all your mates down the pub and <laughs> going on and on and on about this horse riding holiday in Mongolia. The more times you visualise it, the more times the order goes in. The more detail. Mm. Now this is a very important piece which will become important later. The more detail you visualise it in, the more it will go into your subconscious. So let's just visualise it in real detail. Okay, I can see it now. It's going to be marvellous. I'm going to go on a horse riding holiday around Mongolia. It'll be brilliant. There'll be yurts and, and mountains and big grassy plains. There's going to be chickens and little kids with great big furry hats. And there's going to be little ponies and goats. And I'm going to be wearing a big silk cummerbund that floats in the wind. I'm going to look so cool. <laughs> carried away there. The more detail that you visualise it in, the more often it will go in, the more often you visualise it, there, there. Then you will notice your subconscious coming back with dreams, ideas and imaginations and behaviours to make sure you get what you want. Here comes one now. You're sitting in the dentist chair, flicking through National Geographic and boom, what a coincidence! There's an article all about horse riding holidays around Mongolia. You're walking down the street, you've walked down a million times before, and boom, what a coincidence! Here's a plaque on the wall saying this is where you get your jabs for Asia or your visas or something. You'll be sitting having your beans on toast. And suddenly you'll think, of course, Auntie Edna! Boom! She works in Abu Dhabi in finance. She gets loads of air miles. She'll come to an arrangement. And she's, and she's really rich. And before you know it, you, she, Auntie Edna, are all bobbling around on these little ponies in Mongolia. <laughs> I didn't expect there to be so many flies. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. Anyway, there you go. That's the way it's supposed to work. You quite often see this when you get a new car, don't you? You get a new car. And all of a sudden, you see that new car everywhere, and you're like, oh, am I supposed to beep and wave? <laughs> that wears out very quickly. There we are. But yes, you notice these things, and that's the way it's supposed to work. It's good, isn't it? It's good, yeah. You just keep visualising something, and your brain makes sure that you get what you order. Smashing. There we are, nothing to worry about. However, it's a very loyal and faithful problem solving factory and whatever the boss asks for the boss will get so let's just visualize something negative and horsey who on earth would want to visualize something negative and horsey well maybe some of this feels familiar let's just imagine here i'll use my imagination um i am a rubbish horse rider I will always be a rubbish horse rider. Always is good, it's nice and permanent. I will get hurt on a horse. I don't care if other people don't get hurt on a horse, I will get hurt on a horse. If there was a hundred people to fall off a horse, I would be the one that got hurt because I am fundamentally unlucky. I am an unlucky person and I am more unfit than anybody else and if there was any way to hurt themselves, I would hurt them because I am so unfortunate. I am 
more inflexible, less strong, less able to ride a horse. I am just going to get hurt on the horse as soon as I look at the horse. I'm probably hurting the horse. I'm probably riding like a sack of potatoes, giving it a dead sides and a dead mouth and giving it kissing spine because I ride like a sack of spuds. Everybody on the yard hates me. They all gossip behind my back. They call me all the gear and no idea. And they see me walking on this horse, hurting it and giving it kissing spine. And they're all laughing at me and I've got no respect on the yard at all. My family hate me. They hate me because I'm spending all this money on this horse and I'm not even happy and we're not going to be able to afford the mortgage or to go on holiday and it's all my fault. Everybody hates me and the horse hates me as well. Have I missed anything out? <laughs> if I've missed anything out, put it in the comments below. If we think of these things often enough, and we do, and in enough detail, and that was quite a lot of detail, which we do, then our problem-solving factory will start coming back with dreams, ideas and inspirations to make sure that we get what we order. So instead of leaping out of bed when we wake up in the morning, we're going to be feeling slightly different, feeling a little bit anxious now we visualise this future for ourselves. Maybe we won't get out of bed quite so quick and instead of wanting to go and ride our horse, instead we'll be like, I should go down the stables and you're a little bit late and a little bit blur and you get down the stables and you don't get on with it, you don't get on your horse. You go and see Candice and you go, oh, I'm not really feeling it today. And then instead of getting on with it, you're just working a little bit slovenly, not really workmanlike and now time's getting on and oh, I'll ride you tomorrow. I haven't got time to ride you today. Of course, you'll be even hotter tomorrow. So I'm going to lunge you tomorrow. That's right. I'll lunge you tomorrow and then I'll ride you the next day. <laughs> of course, then I've got my lesson coming up and the instructor knows that I haven't ridden you three times a week and it's all my fault and the instructor will speak to the people over there. They'll all start gossiping. They call me all the gear and no idea. I'm just wasting my time. I've got no respect on the yard and everybody hates me. And we're back where we were. Thanks, Problem Solving Factory. You did exactly what was ordered. Compare that behaviour to someone who's getting on really well with their horses. Maybe they can't even ride as well as you can. But they're thinking, in three months time, I can enter this little competition if I get down stables every day and do half an hour every day. And by the time you rock up, <laughs> although you rock up talking to Candice, going, I'm not really feeling it today, they're on their third horse going round and round and round, going, morning! You're going, morning! I don't really like her. <laughs> you go, what's the difference? You got the same amount of arms and legs, you're doing the same activity. The only difference is her vision of the future is positive and yours is negative. There we are. That's the way it works. So it's not only that, unfortunately. As these thoughts of negativity go around your imagination, you are sending pictures around your brain. Pictures of falling off or not doing very well or being laughed at or not having the status that you want and just generally being miserable. Well, the primitive part of your brain evolved much, much earlier than your imagination. So how does it know the difference between the electrical pictures in your brain, which are memories, or the electrical pictures in your brain, which are made up imagination, or the electrical pictures in your brain, which is reality? As I'm standing here now, staring at my phone, <laughs> believing that I'm talking to loads of people, um, for all I know, I'm in a padded cell somewhere. <laughs> I've only got the electrical pictures in my brain to let me know what reality is. The point is, there hasn't been enough time in evolution for your primitive brain to know what imagination is. Your primitive brain does not know the difference between one electrical set of pictures and another electrical set of pictures, between reality, imagination and memory. It just sees these pictures going round of the instructor not respecting you and always getting hurt and being the unluckiest person. And it sees danger. What does a fire officer do when they see danger? Anxiety, anger, depression. 
That's what it does. That's the only five reals it has. So when it sees these imaginary pictures, it will respond with anxiety, anger and depression. There we go. So these are going in here. And you'll find that the more depressed thoughts that you have, the more you easily turn to anger, anxiety and depression. Okay. So there's a mechanism in your primitive mind for dealing with stresses. It can be represented by a bucket. There we go. And I call it my stress bucket. Nice and simple. This is my stress bucket. It lives in my primitive brain. Into my stress bucket goes all the stresses of the day. So, um, let's say I have an argument with my partner and the horse treads on my foot and the car breaks down and I have to catch the bus into work and the bus is late. And when I get to work, um, I've got to go to the shops and I'm in a hurry and that's no good. And when I get to the shops, they haven't got the thing that I ordered and I reserved it as well. And, and then the salesman's really good and sells me something I don't want. And then when I get home, it's not compatible with the thing that I had earlier. And there's a letter from the bank saying I shouldn't have bought anything in the first place. And so I have another argument with my partner. Ooh, look at those stresses. Good day. <laughs> if the stresses go on through the day like this, at the end of the day, I've got a really full stress bucket and I've probably got a really full glass of wine as well. <laughs> there we are. During the night, you get periods of REM sleep. REM, rapid eye movement, you know, when people's eyes are flickering. This is a very energy intensive way of, of dealing with your, with your stresses. This is what happens in REM. You get about 20 minutes of it. It's very energy intensive. It's a proper, proper mental computing process. And in that process, these stresses are getting taken out of your stress bucket, having the emotion taken off and being placed in the back of your brain as a narrative memory so that 20 minutes will get rid of that much and then you go into that deep sleep, that really deep sleep for about 90 minutes to rest and recuperate. After 90 minutes you get another 20 minutes of REM sleep, very energy intensive, taking the emotion off. There we go, there goes another lot and let's get rid of those and put them as a narrative memory in the back of our brain. Then you get another 90 minutes of deep sleep. Then another 20 minutes of REM sleep, dealing with those another 90 minutes of deep sleep, another 20 minutes of REM sleep, and then we wake up and we've got a nice empty bucket ready to start the new day. Super. However, let's just put those real stresses back again. Horse rod on my foot, argument with a partner, letter from the bank, thing from the shop, blah, 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 car broke down. As well as that, Remember, we've got all these imaginary, these ones here, the imaginary ones. Nobody respects me. I'm the unluckiest person. I'll always be bad at horse riding. I'll get hurt. The instructor doesn't like me. I'm giving the horse kissing spine. I'm giving it <laughs> dead sides. Um, my family doesn't like me. I'm not going to be able to afford the mortgage. And the bad thing is, they go over and over and over and over. At least the horse only treads on your foot once. <laughs> over and over and over and over. So they're constantly filling up. We've artificially filled our bucket full of imaginary stresses, none of which are real. So there we go. So when we go to sleep with our artificially filled stress bucket, 20 minutes of REM, 90 minutes of deep sleep, 20 minutes of REM, 90 minutes of deep sleep, 20 minutes of REM, 90 minutes of deep sleep, 20 minutes of REM, wake up in the morning, Got a surplus. You see where this is going. If you have the following day exactly the same, uh, full of imaginary stresses, I'm really unlucky, I'm going to have a horse, I'm going to need own, no one respects me, uh, I'm going to lose my mortgage, I'm going to lose my marriage. Uh. And then you've got the stre proper stresses of the next day, uh, a whole bunch of other things, you know, <laughs> email got on top of you, whatever it was, whatever it was. And in the morning, you're going to have even more of a surplus. Every day, you're going to have a little bit more and a little bit more. 
As your bucket fills up, you are going to more readily turn to the emergency drills because your primitive brain knows that something dangerous is going on and so it is responding with anxiety, anger and depression. You find yourself, as you get more and more stressed as the years go on, you get more and more into this depressed way of thinking that you get more angry, more, more anxious and more depressed ever more readily. Okay then, eventually, if you carry on like this, as the, years, as the years turn into decades, you'll find that your stress bucket is completely full. Then it overflows. And when it overflows, you've got a free-flowing anxiety that has no root cause. And this is when people suddenly realise that they're going to have a panic attack. Suddenly decide that they get phobia out of nowhere. And the point of a phobia is it's irrational. People could get onto an aeroplane, and now suddenly they can't. It's irrational. Um, there we are. This is where behaviours suddenly start with no root cause. However, it's not all bad. Because this is all perfectly normal. The thing is, people come to, the, to therapy or do you know what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I can't. Nothing is wrong with you. This is perfectly normal. At times in our lives, our stress buckets fill up and flow over. One particularly what's the word, stereotypical time is when we're teenagers, we've got our exams, everything's relying on it, plus we've got all the stress of being teenagers anyway, and boyfriends and girlfriends, and do people like me and don't people like me, and introvertism, and then you've got all the work pressures as well, and everyone's saying, oh, your whole future. And is it any wonder, <laughs> you may have heard, that teenagers suffer quite a lot from anxiety, anger, and depression. And then suddenly they decide that they're having eating disorders and what have you, what have you. There we are. Has been known that an angry teenager <laughs> slamming a door is so unfair. <laughs> That's what they're going through. It's not nice. But it is normal. And it's perfectly rational. Another time when this happens, obviously, is when you have kids. Suddenly you've got a little bundle of breakableness and you've got to financially be stable and relationship be stable and da, da 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 And obviously your stress bucket fills up and if it fills up and overflows, that's postnatal depression. There we go. And the amount of riders I've had who said, I used to be good at riding. I used to be able to do anything and go anywhere and do anything. And then I had kids. There we go. There we go. So this is the process that's going on. Now, I did promise, I, I say this, um, or parts of this at my talks, what I don't get to say is the next bit. How we treat depression. How we treat depression. So there we go. This is how it's caused. The solution is to take control of your positive thinking and the power of positive thinking. So what you need to do is let the REM clear your uh, stress bucket, natural process through the night, and you also get REM through hypnosis, tra hypnotic trance as well. You need to be able to do that but the key to allowing that to work and to, for it to empty your bucket is to not artificially fill your bucket full of negative thoughts anyway. Okay. We have to think positive. You have to. This is how it works. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're thinking, yeah, I know about thinking positive, but I don't mean to think negative. Negative thoughts just pop up on their own. Well, you you're quite right as well. They do pop up on their own. All thoughts pop up on their own. Positive thoughts also pop up on their own. No one ever went, oh, give me five minutes. I'm just going to go and have a positive thought. Mm. <laughs> no, they don't. You just go, oh, I've had a good idea. And there you go. Oh, I've had a good idea. Equally, oh, I've had a bad idea. All thoughts pop up on their own. Our minds are a cascade of positive negative, superfluous, stupid, 
idiotic, helpful, unhelpful thoughts. You might think, oh, that cloud looks a bit like a poodle. And mm, what does that mean? Nothing. And you dismiss that straight away. You can dismiss thoughts straight away. Sometimes, if you're feeling particularly depressed, you have a good thought and dismiss that straight away. Or you receive a compliment and dismiss that straight away. Is this sounding familiar? Yeah. You receive a compliment and you're like, uh, uh, there we are. There we are. So you can dismiss thoughts. You can dismiss negative thoughts. All these thoughts are going to pop up on their own anyway. Helpful, unhelpful, positive, negative, superfluous, stupid. It's the ones that you grab hold of and allow into your mind and allow to grow that are the ones that are going to take root. And that process is what you've got control over. So you can say, oh, it's not my fault the negative thoughts pop up anyway. But you have got control whether you allow them through the door of your mind or not. Put a bouncer on the door of your mind. <laughs> you ain't coming in. <laughs> there we are. So, as my work through a hypnotherapist, this is what we're going to do to arrange the positive thoughts to overtake from the negative thoughts. Right then, this is how it works. When it comes to hypnotherapy, let me just clear some of this up. There we are. When it came to my work as a hypnotherapist, just redraw that. Got the conscious brain, the problem solving factory, and the primitive brain. Intellect, primitive. We need to get people. People understand what they need to do. It's getting that knowledge in detail that will mean they have the chance to actually do it. Let me explain. So someone will come in to, for, for hypnotherapy. And what's going to happen in hypnotherapy, you've got your critical part there that needs to basically shut up because that's the part that is going to uh, criticise and in, in an attempt to look after you, stop you getting ripped off uh, or fooled or, or, or led into danger, it will be critical of, of things that it sees. But... If you're feeling under attack, it might be hypercritical. So your, your faithful hypnotherapist comes in and, and, and it's this part of your brain that will sit there going, I'm not hypnotised. He thinks I am. I'm not very good at this. Or maybe he's not very good. And it will be hypercritical. So we need to occupy this. And that's why most inductions have got some sort of puzzle arranged to it. So one particular puzzle uh, is to count backwards from 300. If you've ever had hypnotherapy, the hypnotherapy will say, count backwards from 300, 299, 298. And there we are. Another great puzzle, and I love this one, is which of your hands is warmer at the moment? <laughs> Nobody cares. If, which of your hands is warm? Which of your hands is warmer right at the moment? And you're not going to be able to, and you're going to stop thinking about it because you can't watch my video and still be thinking about that. Another great one. I really like this one. What part of your body is the most comfortable at the moment. And you lay there with your eyes shut going, oh, who knows? Let me just compare my elbow with my knee. Is my elbow more comfy? Yes, it probably is. But is that more comfy than my neck? <laughs> it's brilliant. There we are. And any amount of, of puzzles, because while you're thinking about that puzzle, you're not thinking critically and sabotaging your own experience so there we are we'll just shut that conscious bit up 
Then we've got the primitive bit, the anxious bit. What's the opposite of anxiety? Relaxation. So there will be a heavy uh, emphasis on being relaxed. Relax, relax, relax. The amount of times I've said relax in my life. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, there you are. So you'll relax from your toes to your head, or you'll feel a tide of relaxation going down your body, or relax, relax, relax. There'll be a tape of whale noises, or seaside noises, or something. Everybody loves to be on the seaside. Quite often, the induction scripts will be about holidays and such like, so that you really do feel relaxed and get this anxious part of your brain to relax as much as possible. There we are. So we've shut up the, that bit and we've shut up that bit. We are left with the problem solving factory ready to receive some instructions. This is where we can do our work. Put the correct instructions there. There's no resistance. There we go. The people, people can go away there. So you could do this. You could do this consciously and on purpose. If you wanted to, you don't have to go to the therapist. All you need to do is repeatedly and in detail put the correct instructions in there. I've given away how to be a hypnotherapist. It's the easiest job in the world. That's all you have to do. The key is how do you put the correct instructions in there? Right, well, there's a series of questions. This is the um, the consultation the half hour before you get the induction now obviously this is solution focused hypnotherapy so this is all about putting the solution in there you find the solution through your conversation and you put it in there it used to be very popular that analytical hypnotherapy was all the rage analytical hypnotherapy is all about going back going to your inner child, going to the problems and understanding where your problems came from in the belief that um, as soon as you understand why you've got those problems, there you go, your brain will immediately sort out the reality from the imagination and solve your problems there. Um, that is very good, it's jolly good and it's helped a lot of people, but those people it doesn't help and sat there imagining their traumas over and over again. And you can see that that might not help a certain amount of people. The wonderful thing about solution-focused hypnotherapy is that you're only thinking of the benefits of moving forward to the life that you want. So if it doesn't help somebody, and I find that very hard to believe, um, if it doesn't help somebody, it won't do them any harm. So that's why I really like it. There we are. So counselling also has the same thing. And when, when I started with the, the hypnotherapy, we had a counsellor who was moving into a, a hypnotherapy world and she had a real hard time taking this on board. That counselling, if you're constantly talking about the problems that you've had, that might, only might, helps a lot of people, but it might, further damage to people it doesn't help. She had a hard time, <laughs> hard time getting, getting to grips with that. But there you go. Counselors have to be very, very, very skillful to make sure that they don't artificially fill the bucket, fill the stress bucket with pictures of, of trauma. So now we come to the nitty gritty. What is the picture that we put in there? We can see how important it is to put the picture into your intellectual brain so that your primitive brain has a chance to empty itself. So we need to put how we would like to be in there rather than thinking of how we don't want to be. So whilst we might be filling our brain with I'm so useless, nobody likes me and feeling anxiety, we clearly need to get ourselves into thinking, I'm happy now. Right, that's the key. How can we just, how can we just raise our happiness? That's what we're talking about. Raising our happiness. How can you raise your happiness? This is what we do. Okay, let's get um, a bit of space here. Where can I have a bit of space? I'll just. Okay. 
get some of those off. I'll leave a picture of the brain on just to, to remind us. There we are, just get rid of all those crisses and crosses. So this is what we do. So it all relies on uh, a, a test case that, that came um, where a lady was so depressed, so very depressed, that her, her children were out of control. Um, this was back in the 80s. Her children was out of control, her alcoholic husband, problems at work, the school was phoning her up every day, and she was stuck. She was properly miserable, and there you are. And um, the therapist said, oh, you know, how, how do you want your life to be, and this and that. And what, what do you want out of this session? And she was just, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think. I can't think of anything. I don't know why I'm talking to you. Can't think of anything. She was really gone. And then she said, it would take a miracle. And because the therapist had no further ideas, the therapist said, well, if there was a miracle, how would that help? And she went on to describe ways in which this miracle would give her the life that she wanted. And as she spoke, the therapist saw her perking up a bit as she was describing this miracle that would happen. And from that came this whole solution-focused hypnotherapy. And it's now based on scaling and the miracle question. Let me just write both those down. Scaling and the miracle question. This is what I wish I had more time to explain. Oh, can't stop. Okay. Lovely. Scaling, very simple. Um, if you go in for a course of hypnotherapy, we expect, we expect results within 12 weeks. There we are. The way we judge our results is by asking a scale. You can scale anything. You can scale confidence. You can scale happiness. You can scale excitement, whatever you like. So we'll start, say happiness. How happy do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10? And people come in for their... Uh, for their initial consultations and of course they feel at rock bottom and I'm always quite sad when people come into the ride of confidence and they feel at rock bottom and they've waited till they're level zero in confidence before turning up but I suppose that's human nature and eventually you get desperate you do something about it okay then so scaling let's say um, how happy are you on a scale of one to ten and people will say zero or one or two something something very low anyway okay so scaling two right. and then comes the miracle question if you are going to finish talking to me now and you're going to go home and you're going to go to sleep and all the lights are going to go dark all the little house lights are going to go off and Street lights are going to go off, it's going to be dark, there'll be owls, there'll be the moon. And then the sun will slowly rise and during that night a miracle happens. Something connects in your brain, some neurons grow, something, some neurotransmitters start flowing, something happens in your brain. That means when you wake up in the morning, you're not a two. You're a 10. Okay, you're not a two, you're a 10. When you wake up in the morning and something's happened in your brain and the problem you have come to see me has gone, what will be different? What will be different? And then usually the client will say something vague. I'll be smiling more or I'll be standing straighter or, or I'll, I'll feel happier. And we've got to get to the actual nitty gritty of what will be different. If we were watching two screens, two CCTVs following you about, and one's following you about as number two, 
and one's following you about as number 10. They're not very clear, we can't see your posture, we can't see whether you're smiling or not, we can only see what you're doing, the physical activities that you're doing. When would the, the pictures diverge? What would you be doing different? And what we're trying to get to, uh, if I give an example, um, person A said, well, when I woke up, I wouldn't be feeling anxious. So I can't see, I can't see how you're feeling. What, what, what's not feeling anxious? How, how does that, okay, you're not feeling anxious, got that. How would that look different? And it's like, well, I'd, I'd get out of bed and I'd, I'd, I'd get on with my breakfast and that would give me more time to go to work. And it's like, right, and how would that show itself? Well, how would that be a benefit? No, I wouldn't be in a rush through the traffic. I'd be driving calmer. So we've got actual physical things to see of the actual physical things that you do. You are now driving calmer. You're accelerating less. You're getting to work on time and you're sitting down and you're doing your emails and it means that you've got time to brief your staff. And he was a registrar at a hospital, so quite an important job. And... As he went on and on describing this world that was different that's what we want that's your miracle question now you may have heard that if you want to feel better stand up straight if you want to feel better smile it's all true it's true it's true if you want to do an impression of a depressed person there you go you do your head drops and you slump and if you want to do an impression of a of a happy person, confident person, and if you can, stand up straight and smile, that will help your mood. This extreme, uh, this miracle question is an extreme version of that. So you're taking on the posture of somebody who's a lot happier, but in this miracle question, you're taking on the activities that belong to somebody who is happier. A happier version of you. The more detail, do you remember when I said about the um, riding in Mongolia, the more detail that you can visualize something in and the more often that you visualize it. And what we're trying to do is get down to that detail and as for more often we will certainly get them to visualize it every week <laughs> and encourage them to visualize it more. But we need that detail. People want the vague I will feel happier. But what we need is the actual detail. I will be phoning my mum. I will be arranging to go out. Okay. I will be doing what I want instead of what my husband wants. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't really want to do anything nowadays, so I just let him decide what he wants to do and I just go along with it whether I want to do it or not. It's like, right, okay, so you'll be doing the things that you want to do. Like what? I'll be phoning my friends. So we've already got a picture of somebody phoning their friends and arranging to go out. And then all the little knock-on effects by that, the more detail we can put in. How would your husband notice? Would your husband notice this? Oh yes, definitely he would. What would you notice about your husband that would let you notice this? Well, he wouldn't be constantly asking me if I'm all right. He'll be making me a cup of tea and, and he'll be happy, it'll be a stress off him, so he's standing straighter. Now you're really knocking on to tiny, tiny, tiny details. These are like the drawing pins that hold up the picture of happiness. You need the drawing pins, the actual mechanics. So there we go, that's the miracle question. So we ask this question and we get as much detail, we chase it, chase it, chase it, until it's actually fleshed out. Then. We'll put you into a trance. There we go. Um, give you a puzzle. Which of your, <laughs> which of your, before we go into the trance, of course, we'll um, keep it all nice and light and happy because we've been thinking about that. So you lay down ready for the trance, and you'll ask about the pets or the kids or the holiday, and it's like, oh, how's the new puppy going on? And I'm right now, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, the new puppy's great, and we really enjoy it. And then you're like, okay, <laughs> off you go. Get them. In this, in this intellectual state. So there you are, which of your hands is heavier than the other? You're gonna relax from your head to your toes. And then you start repeating 
easiest job in the world, I'm trying to repeating the solution that they know. Inside your problem solving factory, inside your subconscious mind, that part of your mind that already knows exactly what it is that you have to do and already knows just how you're going to do it. The miracle question is purely us finding a way of opening that door and making public what your problem solving factory already knows exactly what it is that you have to do. So there we go. And then as a hypnotherapist, the easiest job in the world, you're just repeating back what they told you. This is so, under the hypnotic suggestions that, that you induce, they will find themselves far more likely to be carrying out the acts of phoning their mum. And if standing straight and smiling makes you realise that you should be feeling happier, and it does make you feel happier, you can try it now, just that simple imitation, then the imitation of your body doing the things that your body at a number 10 will do will influence it backwards so you will start feeling like you're at the number 10. Plus, you'll actually be achieving the things that you want to achieve. So our registrar will be talking better to his staff because he's briefed them better and he will be on top of his emails as well as going through the actions. And our friend will be phoning her friends and so on and so on. So taking the time to sit and work out the miracle question and all the consequences that that would do is how to get through to our subconscious mind to give their, to give their um, opinions. So week number two comes along and the person comes in again and you say, how was your week? And they'll either say it was good or bad. They say it was, usually they'll say it was good. They'll, they'll try and help. Um, and if they say it was bad, you go, ooh, what was bad? And they'll go, ooh, there you are, this was bad. And then you'll go, uh, okay, so when did that happen? And they'll have to pick a day. And you'll say, well, what, what was the good thing before that? And you'll find those little nuggets of, of good stuff that happened that they would have ignored earlier. So there you go. So they'll come in, you'll say, how are you this week? What scale are you? How's your happiness? Is it a number two? And you'll go, no, it's a, it's a, it's a number four. That, that, that's good. I've, I've improved a bit. You want it to be moving up all the time, moving up all the time. If it's not moving up all the time, then they haven't been putting the effort in. There we are. So it's a different person coming through the door every time. You ask the same miracle questions, the same format over and over again, because you're not asking the same question, even though you are, because you're asking it to a different person. When a person comes in and goes, oh, I'm a number four, they were a number two last week. So you are asking a new person the miracle question. And that person at number four will have different answers to the person at number two. And to start off with, it's all a bit vague and all a bit like, oh, I'd be winning the lottery and, and, and silly thinking like that. But you persist. And by the time you've got on to weeks five and six, then they're already doing the work. They're already coming in, thinking of things to say to you. It's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, number, I'm a number seven this, this week, and these were the good things, because I've done my work, and they have done their work, otherwise it wouldn't be a number seven, and they're already prepared. It means that they're starting to notice the good things in their life, because life's full of good and bad, <laughs> you've got to notice the good things, starting to notice the compliments, and that way, the miracle question is being asked to a number six person and a number seven person. And there we go. You have to visualize what your body would be doing. And that's our job as hypnotherapists, to ask people the miracle question over and over again to an ever increasing rate of happiness in that person. I hope that all made sense. 
Okay, I've been talking for quite a while now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ring off. Thank you very much for, for listening. If you're still with me, give us some hearts, give me some thumbs. Whee! I hope that I've explained what we need to do. Our problem solving factory already knows exactly what we've got to do. And to winkle it out is the miracle question. Okay, I'm gonna get the comments back on there. There we go, beautiful. Right, I'm just gonna run through the comments, see if anyone's got the... There we go. There we are. So this is, this is what happens. If you wanna go and get help from your friendly neighborhood hypnotherapist, that's what they're going to do. You don't have to. You don't have to, because they're just repeating to you the steps that you've told them that they need to do. And that's what we do. Okay then, my lovelies, I hope this has been of help. Um, the link between uh, depression and rider confidence comes back to when people have got an impression of themselves who is not a confident rider. So the solution is, my confidence is number two, because you visualize yourself as somebody not in control. My confidence is number two. If there was a miracle during the night and your confidence in your horses and you woke up and you were a 10, what would you be doing differently? And I hope that the answers would be, I'd be planning my lessons. I'd be taking more reasonable bite sizes. I'd be thinking about how to desensitize my horse. All those things that I talk about are all built on this model, all of them. So there we go. Okay then. As I say, I've been talking for a while now. There's been a lot of comments. There's been a lot of uh, contributors. Thank you very much. I'm going to read through them and we'll see whether I need to come back. Um, I'm sure there's bits that I've missed and as soon as I ring off, it's like, oh, why did I tell them about this and that and the other? Oh, I know a bit that I haven't spoken about that I really do need to speak about, so stay with me. So your primitive brain and your intellectual brain are on a seesaw for survival reasons. Oh, I'm glad I remembered this. <laughs> I've been really cross <laughs> oh, Anxiety, anger, depression. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, for survival reasons, either your primitive brain's in charge and you're doing fight or flight, or your intellectual brain's in charge. If your primitive brain is in charge, then you're properly under attack. If a lion was to come down those stairs, it wouldn't do any good to be in my intellectual brain at all. I need to get out of there. I wouldn't be thinking, oh, right, look at that, there's a lion. Let's all stay intellectual about this. That's unusual in Britain. I expect it's, it's escaped from the circus or the zoo. I wonder if it's trained. Sit. That wouldn't be a good idea at all. So my primitive brain takes over, uh, my blood goes cold, my stomach churns, all the blood goes to the muscles and I'm out of there like a shot. That's all jolly good while we're under attack from lions. If I'm under attack from emails and schools and work, I respond the same. My muscles, my, my uh, blood goes cold, my stomach churns, I start to sweat. And there's nowhere to run. But there we go. This is why we mustn't be intellectual. However, we're not under attack. Not under attack. There's always the option of forcing your intellect to the top. And when you force your intellect to the top, your primitive drops. It has no choice. Your primitive is suppressed. Whether or not there's adrenaline. Okay, so this lion's coming down the stairs and we're all running away. Unless there's a baby. 
just down here. Then you don't run away. Then you stop and you pick up the chair and you start throwing the chair at the lion or you start picking up the, the, the chair I've got. You can't see them over there. I've got some bridles there. I could use them as a, as a whip. Something, something. You can override that and bring your intellect to the fore. And if you can do that with a lion, <laughs> you can do it with your emails. You've always got the choice. In the end, can you still see this? In the end, the boss of the factory is the boss of the factory. Look at it like this, right? There's a, the, the health and safety officer has got the fire drills. The health and safety officer has been going a little bit crazy lately and setting off the fire drills for any reason whatsoever. Oh, set, set him off as soon as it sees a passing cloud or whatever. And the boss says, look, I've had enough of this. Goes down and sees the fire and health and safety officer. And it says, I do appreciate that you've got a job to do to look after this building. But ultimately, I'm your employer. I'm the one that says, and I'm saying to you, stop doing those fire drills on this factory unless this or this or this, which has never happened. Ultimately, you're always in control and you can force your intellect up, which means your primitive goes down. Okay, super. As I said, I, I did promise I'd go and then I got all excited and, and did it again. I hope you've enjoyed this. I am actually going to go now. It's been lovely speaking to you. Thank you to all your contributions. I'm going to read the comments below. If you've not got my book yet, then go to www.carlgreenwood.co.uk. Bye. Thank you for coming.